Hello, and welcome to Early and Often, the history of elections in America, episode 32, Riot. Last time we introduced Thomas Hutchinson, the politician slash historian who became one of the last governors of Colonial Massachusetts, as well as the author of one of the most important histories of Massachusetts. Hutchinson had been born into a quite prominent family of merchants, and he followed in his ancestors' footsteps. Even as a young man, he proved to be very good at business, and he began amassing a small fortune. He also entered politics when he was still young, joining the general court at age just 26. This was a time when coming from a prominent family was essential to your success, but despite his background, Hutchinson still faced some difficulties. He was respected by the colonists, but he took a hardline stance against paper money, which was unpopular with his constituents. He was voted out of office once in the early 1740s and again at the end of the decade, after he led a successful attempt to return the colony to gold and silver. Afterwards, he was appointed to the upper house of the court to continue his political rise, and that's pretty much where we left off. This episode will continue his story, but from a slightly different angle, with a look at Hutchinson's involvement in two major riots in Boston. One against attempts by the British Navy to kidnap men to serve on their ships, and the other against British attempts to directly tax the colonies, and against Hutchinson himself. As we get closer to the American Revolution, mobs and riots are going to become an increasingly important feature of American political life, so I want to introduce them early. Anyway, to start this episode we have to go back in time just a few years, back to 1747, when Hutchinson was still in the lower house of the general court. He was serving as Speaker of the House, which made him one of the most important officials in the colony. One of the big issues at this time was naval impressment. Impressment was basically when agents of the government would kidnap you and force you into joining the British Navy. Life in the Navy back then sucked big time, and joining the Navy was very hazardous to your health, to say the least. So there was always a big recruitment shortfall which had to be made up through impressment. They would send out press gangs to capture unwary men, sometimes through trickery, sometimes at the barrel of a gun. This happened both in Britain and in the colonies. There were rules about which Americans could be impressed and under what circumstances, for instance, the governor had to sign off on it beforehand, but the rules were ambiguous and British officers often flouted them anyway. Naturally, this was super unpopular in the colonies. Nobody likes being kidnapped, and the threat of impressment hurt the economies of local towns as men would flee the area to avoid capture. And remember, the economy of New England was already suffering at this time, and just a few years previously, a press gang had straight up murdered two New Englanders who had refused to comply with their illegal impressment. So across the 1700s, there had been periodic resistance to impressment. Some of it was unofficial, men would riot in order to get their friends freed, but some of the resistance was official as well. Nobody in New England liked impressment, even elected officials. To some extent they had to live with it, but they did what they could to put checks on the practice. In fact, in 1702, the lieutenant governor of Massachusetts had actually ordered cannons to fire on a ship that was impressing men without permission. Thomas Hutchinson, too, had been active in trying to get impressed men released, and in trying to weaken the Navy's power to impress men in the first place. So that brings us to 1747, the year of the Knowles Riot, the biggest anti-impressment riot in colonial America. A British naval squadron had just spent two months in Boston Harbor, getting refitted and resupplied for a journey to the Caribbean. While in Boston, a good number of sailors deserted, often joining up with American merchants instead. The ships had to make up for the losses before they departed, and so Commodore Charles Knowles ordered some of his sailors to go out and capture as many men as they could. Which they did. They captured some carpenters on the way to work, they boarded a civilian vessel and impressed almost all these sailors on it. All in all, they took 46 men. The New Englanders immediately started to complain that this was a violation of their charter. The governor hadn't given his permission for the Navy to impress anyone, and some of the men who'd been taken were supposed to be exempt anyway. Commodore Knowles ignored the protests completely. So the next day, a mob assembled in Boston. They began capturing whatever British officers and sailors they could get their hands on, as hostages to get the impressed men freed. Now, I should talk about what mobs were like in colonial America, because they weren't just a bunch of drunk rabble breaking windows and beating people up like you might imagine. Riots were, generally, a lot more coordinated than that. They can be seen as a purposeful effort by the community at large to defend itself. Back in England, there was a long tradition of what you might call semi-peaceful rioting. That is, rioting which was controlled and which targeted property rather than people. If your lord put up a fence and tried to claim some common land for himself, you and your fellow villagers might get together in a little mob to tear it down, that sort of thing. 
Of course, there is always a risk of things spiraling out of control and into a major revolt, but generally speaking, these riots were minor affairs. This tradition was carried over to America, where rioting was seen as a somewhat legitimate way for the community to express its grievances, if the authorities weren't paying enough attention. Fighting impressment is an obvious example of this. Who wants a bunch of English naval officers coming to your town and kidnapping the menfolk? So the town would get together and stop it from happening. But there were plenty of other instances as well. During several food shortages in Boston, mobs formed to stop food from being exported. In an early case of NIMBYism, another Boston mob burned down a nearby smallpox hospital which they suspected was responsible for an outbreak within the city. Don't worry, the hospital had been evacuated before they burnt it down. Or the mob might go after customs officials collecting an unjust tariff, or judges issuing an unpopular ruling, and try to intimidate them into compliance. Rioting could also enforce public morality, as when they shut down brothels or stopped dissenting religious movements from holding meetings. You might disagree with some of those actions, but from the perspective of the colonists, they were done in communal self-defense. They may have been illegal, but they supported the purpose of the laws, which was the well-being of the community. Just as much as elections, the threat of violence kept officials in check, and made sure that their enforcement of the laws was properly tempered by public opinion. Riots, at least these sorts of riots, supported the social order rather than challenging it. And because these mobs were communal affairs rather than just rabble run amok, they tended to stay within reasonable bounds. Leading members of the community were often involved, merchants and lawyers and so on, and they could put a stop to it if things ever got out of hand. In Boston, supposedly the mobs were so well disciplined that they refused to riot on the Sabbath. Generally, these were more about threats of violence than actual violence. Property might be destroyed, and maybe some officials would get roughed up, but that was usually the extent of it. I don't want to say that there was never real violence, but it was atypical. One of the reasons things rarely got out of hand is that colonial officials were surprisingly lenient towards these riots, partly because they simply didn't have the manpower to suppress them. At this time, there was little in the way of professional law enforcement, nor were there many soldiers in colonial America. At most, you had some elected sheriffs. So the law was often enforced by the general populace. Instead of using police officers to get things done, you relied on the citizens. In other words, the same people who might also be forming a mob. So when a mob did form, there was no one you could call on. Your law enforcement officers were the mob. Another reason officials were lenient is that if they were too harsh, they might just cause an even bigger backlash. It's a lot like all of those little rebellions from the previous century I've talked about in past episodes the thrusting out of Governor Harvey in Virginia, the various rebellions in Maryland and North Carolina, and so on. If you look back on these various rebellions, you'll notice that most of the time the rebels were never really punished with anything more than a slap on the wrist. In some cases, like with Culpeper's Rebellion in North Carolina or with the overthrow of the Dominion, the rebellion was in fact more or less accepted as legitimate. The big exception was Bacon's Rebellion, which ended with Governor Barkley hanging a full 24 men. But like I said, that was an exception, and Barclay was seen by his contemporaries as having acted far too harshly. These sorts of rebellions were, if not exactly accepted by the authorities, then at least acknowledged as the sort of thing that happens from time to time, a way for the people to make their grievances heard. You didn't want to be too lenient, and sometimes small rebellions could in fact become big ones, but you didn't want to be too harsh either and risk alienating your subjects. And so small rebellions were tolerated, and sometimes the rebels were integrated into the system. At most, you'd execute a few ringleaders to send a message to everyone else. The same basic idea applied to these riots. You wanted to punish the riots to make sure that the colonists couldn't form mobs with impunity, but you didn't want to punish them so much that you just made people angry. But perhaps the main reason that officials were lenient is that very often their sympathies were with the rioters. I mean, probably some of them were leading the riots behind the scenes, although it's hard to know for sure. Even a conservative like Thomas Hutchinson sympathized with the crowd and was willing to work with them, up to a point. In his words, quote, mobs, a sort of them at least, are constitutional, end quote. Thomas Jefferson called them, quote, an evil productive of good, end quote. It was supposed to be a last resort when legal means had failed, but it still had a place. And certainly the Knowles riot was such a case. British officials were acting illegally and ignoring all of the complaints being leveled against them. What else was there to do but take some hostages? This is an alien mindset to us today, but I think it made more sense at the time. Today, there are a lot of nonviolent ways for citizens to make themselves heard, most especially voting. 
But back then, America was ruled by a bunch of unelected officials from 3,000 miles away, who were often very insensitive to local demands. In that environment, mobs were a somewhat acceptable part of maintaining public order. They were dangerous, but ultimately they were an acknowledged part of the colony's informal constitution. So that's the background for the anti-impressment riot that just broke out in Boston. As it happened, Thomas Hutchinson was one of the first officials on the scene. Naturally, he was pretty sympathetic to the mob, and they were willing to hear what he had to say. He managed to talk them into releasing some of the officers they were holding, on the grounds that they hadn't been the ones involved with the impressment. Hutchinson then left and went to the home of Governor William Shirley to inform him of the situation. The mob soon followed. They confronted the governor, and he denied having authorized the impressment, which was true. While they were talking, some of the hostages managed to escape into the governor's house. The mob tried to follow, but they were prevented from going inside. To vent their frustration and to send a message, they beat one of their remaining captives right there in front of the governor's mansion. But after that, they withdrew for the moment. Later in the day, the governor went to the general court to decide what to do. Governor Shirley wanted to call out the militia and to issue a statement condemning the mob, but Hutchinson and the rest of the assembly were more cautious. They were much more sympathetic to the rioting than the unelected governor. The discussion went on for a while, too long, apparently. That evening, the mob returned. They surrounded the building in which the governor and general court were meeting. They smashed in all the windows on the first floor and forced themselves inside. Again, they confronted the governor. Shirley addressed the crowd, condemning the impressment and promising to do something about it, but also condemning the rioting. And again, the confrontation ended inconclusively, with the crowd withdrawing for the time being. A new day dawned, but Boston was still in a state of unrest. Shirley had called out the militia the night before, but to his horror, no one shut up. In fact, many of the militiamen were in the mob itself. Not only that, Commodore Knowles was now threatening to bombard the town with his cannons in order to restore order and get his men back, saying, quote, By God, I'll now see if the king's government is not as good as a mob. Feeling isolated and worried, Shirley fled to a nearby fort. The governor was now obviously in a very difficult position. He had to both talk down the mob and talk down the Commodore before things really got out of hand. Thankfully, he was a good politician. He met with Commodore Knowles and managed to get him to promise to release the impressed men. He then offered leniency for the rioters if they would go home and let the militia come out to restore order. He pretended that the rioters were merely, quote, a great number of seamen and other lewd and profligate persons, end quote, rather than a bunch of normal citizens. That was enough to finally get Hutchinson and the general court to cooperate. They now issued a statement condemning the riot and calling for the militia. Now that it was the elected legislature telling them what to do, the mob stood down and the militia took to the streets. In short order, the impressed men were released, the hostages were released, the British fleet sailed away, and everything went back to normal. The whole affair was over in just three days. Some property had been damaged and a few officials had been roughed up, but otherwise there had been no deaths or anything. Nothing irreversible, though obviously there had been some risks. Well, realistically, I don't think that Knowles was ever going to fire on Boston, but you never know. Anyway, a few years after the Knowles riot, Hutchinson lost his seat in the lower house of the general court. But soon afterwards, he was appointed to the upper house instead. From there, he continued his rise, no longer encumbered by the need to appeal to voters. He started amassing offices, often holding several important positions at once. He was named Lieutenant Governor in 1758 and Chief Justice in 1760, despite the fact that he had no legal training. He hadn't actually sought the job, but he accepted it when offered. As a judge, he was actually pretty popular with the common people, since he tended to use common sense when making his rulings rather than legal technicalities. However, it made him very unpopular with other lawyers and officials, who thought that an unqualified guy was taking their jobs for his own personal benefit at the expense of good government. And really, the mere fact that he was so successful was enough to make enemies. It wasn't unusual for a politician back then to hold several offices, but Hutchinson took it to an extreme. And not only that, he was pretty nepotistic as well. He made sure that his unqualified sons got jobs. And not only that, Hutchinson's family had ties to other important families as well. Take, for example, the Oliver family. When Hutchinson was serving as governor a few years later, a member of the Oliver family, Andrew Oliver, was serving as lieutenant governor and Oliver's brother was serving as Chief Justice. They were very closely related in numerous ways. Thomas Hutchinson's sister-in-law was married to Andrew Oliver, and while Hutchinson was serving as governor, three of his children married into the Oliver family. A son married Andrew Oliver's daughter, 
a daughter married his nephew, and another of Hutchinson's sons married his grandniece. So basically, the same family controlled the governorship, the lieutenant governorship, and the chief justiceship. This sort of tight-knit power naturally aroused suspicion and envy among everyone else. For the first time, people were starting to argue that this sort of behavior was inappropriate, that one man shouldn't be able to monopolize power that way. So even as he became more and more successful, Hutchinson's popularity was starting to erode. His enemies were attacking him in the press on a regular basis, and there were legitimate concerns about his behavior. However, he was still a respected figure in Massachusetts. That would only change in the 1760s, as America's relationship with Britain suddenly began to deteriorate. That brings us to the Stamp Act of 1765. You remember the Stamp Act, right? It was that hated piece of legislation passed by the British Parliament which directly taxed the colonists in order to pay for the British troops stationed in America. Taxation without representation, the worst thing you could do to an American. In Connecticut, it was the Stamp Act which helped the New Lights finally take the governorship away from the Old Lights, since the New Lights were much more enthusiastic about resisting the Act. Well, the Stamp Act caused trouble in Massachusetts as well. When word first reached the colonies that Parliament was considering passing the Stamp Act, everyone was outraged. Many of the colonial legislatures decided to send petitions to London in protest, including in Massachusetts. The lower house of the general court drafted a very strong statement, framed in the language of natural rights, stating that the Stamp Act was illegitimate. However, Hutchinson, who as lieutenant governor was also head of the upper house, blocked that statement as, quote, informal and incautiously expressed, end quote. Now, Hutchinson was himself opposed to the Stamp Act, just like everyone else. He thought that the British government was overstepping its bounds in a way that was likely to provoke a dangerous reaction. But although he thought it was a bad idea, he didn't think that the Stamp Act was illegitimate. It may have violated English norms about self-taxation, but it wasn't illegal. Parliament had the ultimate authority, and they could do what they wanted, even if it violated the traditional rights of the colonies. If Parliament was to be sovereign, that meant that it was fully sovereign, and no abstract notions of rights could change that. Otherwise, they would soon cease to have a government at all, as everyone challenged laws they hated on the basis of natural rights. This put him in opposition to most of his fellow New Englanders. They felt that the Stamp Act was illegitimate, and dangerously so. In modern terms, they felt like the Constitution was being flagrantly violated, while Hutchinson merely felt like an informal precedent had been broken. So unlike the lower house, Hutchinson was only willing to go so far in his opposition. He was willing to fight the law, but not to fight Parliament. So the two houses of the General Court got together to draft a joint statement opposing the Stamp Act. The populace in the lower house kept trying to insert language about natural rights and theories of government, but Hutchinson kept blocking them each time, until the populace were worn down and agreed to a compromise statement which sidestepped the issues they actually cared about. But as it turned out, a lot of the other colonial legislatures did send petitions with angry talk of natural rights, so Hutchinson's maneuverings had accomplished nothing. It just made Massachusetts seem weak and the populists feel cheated, and Parliament passed the Stamp Act anyway. So although Hutchinson clearly opposed the act, his opposition didn't go far enough for most people. He did try to stop the act from being passed, and when it was passed, he tried to get it repealed. He even sent a formal protest to London, arguing that the Stamp Act was both unjust and economically unwise, since it would wind up costing Britain more money than it brought in. But he wasn't willing to say that the Stamp Act was in some sense illegal. He wasn't willing to disobey. You may have noticed a possible contradiction here. After all, Hutchinson had been willing to passively cooperate with the mob during the Knowles Riot, so why was this different? Why support illegal resistance against the British then, but not now? Well, I think that part of the reason was that the impressments Commodore Knowles had been carrying out were themselves illegal. He hadn't gotten permission to impress anyone, and he impressed the wrong men. So in the Knowles Riot, illegality was being used to fight illegality. The Stamp Act, on the other hand, was legal, and so illegal methods shouldn't be used to fight it. That's a fairly fine distinction, and it didn't matter much to anyone except Hutchinson himself. The average Puritan in the street saw impressment in the Stamp Acts as both being examples of British tyranny which ought to be resisted. He didn't care about the specifics of parliamentary supremacy one bit. Not many people have ever been sticklers for legal formalities like that. So Hutchinson felt duty-bound to enforce the Stamp Act no matter how hated it was. But to everyone else, this didn't seem like someone standing on principle. It seemed like someone who was secretly in league with the British pretending to oppose the Stamp Act while actually doing everything in his power to enforce it. All of a sudden, Hutchinson appeared to be an evil schemer, a double agent who was cooperating with the British in order to enrich himself and his family, and install himself as some sort of dictator. 
John Adams, for instance, came to loathe Hutchinson. According to him, quote, The liberties of this country have more to fear from one man, the present Governor Hutchinson, than from any other man, nay, from all the other men in the world, end quote. All this after Hutchinson had been until recently one of the more respected men in the colonies. Absurd rumors swirled not only that he supported the Stamp Act, but that he had come up with the idea in the first place. And these weren't just anonymous rumors either. One of Hutchinson's main rivals in the lower house was directly accusing him of all this. Basically, the colonies were descending into a bout of paranoia. The Stamp Act had been unexpected, now everyone in the colonies thought that the British were out to destroy their liberties and reduce them to a state of utter submission. That wasn't really true, although the British were trying to weaken colonial independence. But in any case, from the Stamp Act onwards, the colonies would be blanketed with conspiracy theories like the one aimed at Hutchinson right now. Hutchinson tried to fight back, but because he was unwilling to condemn the Stamp Act in the strong language demanded by the populists, all of his protests seemed hollow. And to be fair, it didn't help matters that his brother-in-law, Andrew Oliver, had been appointed as the official who would collect the stamp tax. And Hutchinson did favor close ties with Britain, and he did believe that Parliament had ultimate authority. But despite that, he was no mere British lackey. He was willing to stand up for the interests of his fellow colonists when he thought it was appropriate. Nor did he want despotism, but to resist lawful authority was anarchy, which would be no better in the long run. What he wanted was for both sides to compromise. The colonists shouldn't challenge Parliament's authority, and Parliament shouldn't push its authority to the breaking point. He hoped that both sides would avoid fighting over principles and instead negotiate over actual policies. If both sides fought over principles, then there could be no agreement. Either Parliament would win and truly destroy whatever rights the colonists had, or the colonists would win and become de facto independent. But Hutchinson thought that independence, quote, must prove the ruin of the colony. An independent America would be at the mercy of other European powers, most of whom would be less gentle than the British were. He had no confidence that an independent America would survive. So, it was better, quote, to submit to some abridgment of our rights than to break off our connection, end quote. Unfortunately for him, almost no one in Britain or America felt the same way. Now they were both angling for a confrontation. And that confrontation soon came. Over nine months, there were at least 60 riots against the Stamp Act across America, and against the officials enforcing the Stamp Act. They weren't yet particularly violent, but I think everyone sensed that something had changed, that these crowds were different from the ones that had come before, less controlled and more aggressive. On the night of August 14, 1765, a mob went after Andrew Oliver, the brother-in-law slash stamp tax collector. They trashed his office and attacked his home. That same night, another mob assembled outside Hutchinson's house, demanding that he come out and assure them that he did in fact oppose the Stamp Act. Hutchinson refused to be pressured and he stayed inside. Eventually, the crowd moved along. However, twelve nights later, on August 26th, a large mob returned to his house. Hutchinson again refused to go out to talk to the mob, but this time they met business. His panicking daughter had to plea with him to flee, which Hutchinson later thought may have saved his life. After he had fled, the mob moved into his house. According to historian Bernard Balin, quote, The riders smashed in the doors with axes, swarmed through the rooms, ripped off wainscoting and hangings, splintered the furniture, beat down the inner walls, tore up the garden, and carried off into the night, besides 900 pounds sterling in cash, all the plate, decorations, and clothes that had survived, and destroyed or scattered in the mud all of Hutchinson's books and papers, including the manuscript of Volume 1 of his history, and the collection of historical papers that he had been gathering for years as the basis for public archive." End quote. A real shame about those papers, in my opinion. Hutchinson appeared before the Superior Court the next day, and protested his innocence with tears in his eyes. Quote, Sensible that I am innocent, that all the charges against me are false, I cannot help feeling, and though I am not obliged to give an answer to all the questions that may be put me by every lawless person, yet I call God to witness, and I would not for a thousand worlds call my Maker to witness to a falsehood. I say I call my Maker to witness that I have never, in New England or in Old, in Great Britain or America, neither directly nor indirectly, was aiding, assisting, or in the least promoting or encouraging what is commonly called the Stamp Act." End quote. He closed with a plea that New Englanders might follow the law instead of turning to violence. Quote, I pray God give us better hearts. Fears of a more general turmoil swept through New England. Other officials, seeing what had happened to Hutchinson, quietly packed up their belongings and vanished for a little while until things calmed down. 
There had been mob violence before in the colonies, but this was at a new level, and it was shocking to the colonists, especially given Hutchinson's high status. No one had been physically harmed, but people could see that things were heading in that direction. And within a few years, people were regularly attacked, beaten, and tarred and feathered. And if you got tarred and feathered, that meant that hot tar was poured all over your body, followed by feathers that would stick to you. It wasn't fatal, but it was still a very unpleasant thing. Mob violence like this will be an important part of our story going forward, even well after the revolution itself. This was by no means the end of Thomas Hutchinson's career, although perhaps it was the beginning of the end. He remained in office and he refused to be intimidated by the mob. In his role as Chief Justice, he made sure to enforce the Stamp Act and crack down on anti-British agitation. Behind the scenes, he tried to come up with a plan which might reinforce British authority in the colonies without provoking another backlash, a plan which might restore the old order that he loved so much. But as we'll see when we get to the American Revolution, it was all for nothing. Nobody would listen to him on either side. Although he became governor in a few years' time, he wouldn't stay there for long. Soon enough, the revolution would force him into a permanent exile, and he would spend his last few years in England, despised by both the British and his fellow colonists as the man most responsible for the crisis. Some of the accusations against him were true. He was nepotistic and grasping and too powerful. But he certainly wasn't the caricature his enemies made him out to be. That was more a product of anti-British paranoia and incipient war fever. He was a man well suited to his age. The only trouble was his age was fast ending. Already partisanship had eroded the old norms of hierarchy across New England. But beyond that, there were deeper problems. The British government was determined to prove that it had ultimate authority in the colonies, while the colonists were equally determined to prove that they didn't. In such an environment, compromise was not only impossible, it was treasonous. And Hutchinson simply couldn't bring himself to support rebellion. He was a moderate in a time of immoderation. But now we're getting ahead of ourselves. It's time to leave New England for now. We followed the decline of the old order for the last seven episodes, but the rise of the new order will be another topic altogether. New England had clearly entered a new post-Puritan age, but no one knew what that meant just yet. Partisanship and violent mobs, apparently. Liberty and natural rights and republicanism as well. We'll just have to wait and see. Next episode, we'll move down south and back in time to New York to see how that colony is faring in the wake of Leicester's Rebellion 70 years ago. So join me next time on Early and Often, The History of Elections in America. The podcast is on Twitter, at EarlyOftenPod, or go to the blog at EarlyOftenPodcast.wordpress.com for transcripts of every single episode. And if you like the podcast, give it a good review on iTunes. That helps. Thanks for listening. Thank you.